Thanks for the uh, warm welcome again. I hope as we consider this topic, looking at the two awesome Jewish issues, that this will mean something to you. Number one, Yeshua himself, and then the second is the Jewish holiday of tabernacles. I trust that you will both be encouraged to see him who is our everything, and then be empowered or emboldened to share him with all peoples here in Australia and around the globe. Today we'll consider three aspects of this holiday called the Feast of Tabernacles. First, the, the institution of the holiday in the Torah itself. Second, the two major celebrations that were extant at the time of Yeshua. You'll love those two ceremonies and what they say. And finally, the future implications of Sukkot. Sukkot is the word in the plural, even as we see in the English tabernacles. So first then, is the biblical account from the Older Testament. Do you like that term, older? Yeah, I do. So first we're going to look at the biblical institution. The main text for any Jewish festivals, studies, it's always Leviticus 23. And there we see that God actually established the weekly Sabbath and seven other events. The Hebrew word is moed, so they're moedim, which means appointments uh, to establish the seven. So the seven, as you can see, are Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or matzahs, and the First Fruits, each of which takes place in the same one-week period for your reference, usually near your Easter. Holiday number four of seven is Pentecost, good for reach out, good for us, that's us, uh, or the Feast of Weeks, which takes place seven weeks later than Passover, plus a day or two, 50 days since Passover. Then come for us the spring festivals or appointments with the Almighty, their number five, Rosh Hashanah, which just happened last week, Thursday, Friday. It's, Rosh Hashanah is head of the year, and if you're a biblical person, you know that this is the seventh month. So you say, Bob, how is it the head of the year if it's the seventh month? Because the Jewish calendar, we've got a couple, we've got four calendars, I'm not going to burden you, but we've got the biblical redemption calendar, which begins in about March, April with the month of Nisan, where we have Passover and those three holidays. And then we have the civil calendar, which marks the anniversary of the creation of the world 5,785 years ago. So that might confuse some, and maybe that will help you. All right, so Rosh Hashanah was last week, and this coming Friday, Saturday is, and you say, why do you say Friday, Saturday? Which one is it? Because it begins on the evening, and it concludes in the evening the next day. We get that from Genesis 1. You've read it, and it was evening and morning, day one. And maybe this will help you. This is a bonus. You guys get it. Other people don't get this one. So you're welcome. Uh, you know that your day tomorrow actually begins now. Right? Some of you are thinking, oh, what, is he going to keep talking? I've got things to do tomorrow. So I need to get home, so I need to do those things so that I can go to sleep, so I can get my amount of sleep, so that I can wake up and have the day tomorrow. Your day begins, if you wait till the morning to you let your day begin, you're already behind. Is that true? Oh, I should have woken up at 7 because I have those things to do. But if you plan your day tonight, you'll be rested and you'll enter into a day more normally. See, the Jewish people gave you a bonus. All right, so Friday this week, Saturday, is the 10th day of the seventh month. That's Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement. Actually, it's in the plural. Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonements. And then the seventh holiday, the culmination of all the appointments, the Feast of Tabernacles. By the time of Yeshua, Jesus, this festival, Feast of Tabernacles, was called the Feast due to its importance. Now, each of these groupings, spring, summer, and autumn, are harvest festivals as well, as God required the people to bring specific offerings from the agricultural produce, which would abound during harvest seasons. 
And spiritually, each holiday has something to do with our wilderness wanderings, which began with the exodus in Egypt. Listen to this text from Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 23. Speak to the people of Israel and say, on the 15th day of this seventh month, see, it's always it's good when Jewish holidays begin on the 15th of a month. What do we have? What's the moon look like on the first day of the month? It's not there. It's a new moon. It's black outside. On the 15th of the month, it's the full moon. You always know when the full moon is because the moon is bright, even in Queensland. All right. On the 15th day of the seventh month and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths in order that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, which is signed God. Now the Lord issued two commands in that text to the Jewish people that were to characterize this holiday. You might have heard me emphasize them. We were told to remember so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in the booths. And secondly, in verse 39 and 41, we're commanded to rejoice. Commanded. Like Paul to the Philippians. I say again, rejoice. Okay? No missing the point here. God wants us to remember who he is and what we did and what he did and to rejoice and celebrate that. In our text, God gives us two visual aids by the which we're able to remember and rejoice. Remember and rejoice. I like these visual aids. I need helps to, to keep me doing what the Almighty asks. So the two aids are the sukkah, the booth itself. You see that one there. And what the text says in the verse about the fruit of beautiful trees, palm branches, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So this sukkah, this sukkah is an impermanent structure, as you can see in the picture here, big enough for the tallest member of the family with three sides, they're complete, and the roof is supposed to be see-through. We're supposed to be able to see the stars as we sit in our booth during the week. Many people sleep out there. In Israel, you can see this, this sukkah. Some, some put their cable TV network into their television, in, into their sukkah, so they don't miss their favorite TV shows. I, I'm not sure that's exactly what the Almighty had in mind uh, for us to converse about impermanence. Now, when I grew up, I was an Orthodox Jew in my youth. I, we did not have a sukkah in our home. Uh, but the rabbi would come by our house. We had a big weeping willow tree out front, and he would collect those uh, for, the, for the people to use at the synagogue. The sukkah I knew and used was at the shul at the, at the synagogue I attended. It was big enough for the tallest member of the community, and we used to hang all kinds of fruit from the, from the, the roof and from the sides. I like this holiday. Since the sukkah is supposed to be a lean-to. Listen, everything I build leans a little. So I'm actually a very good and accomplished sukkah builder. We're also told to use the vegetation around us to teach us. The leaves all combined into what we call the lulav. Lulav, and then this yellow fruit. It looks like a lemon, but it's mm, a, a little spicier. Uh, each element of the lulav, that's the palm tree, the myrtle, and the willow, uh, represent a part of the human body. As you can see, the palm branch right up the middle is our spine, and the myrtle, our eyes, and the willow, our lips, and the etrog, that's the, the citron, uh, represents our heart. 
So we take those four species together and we stand inside the sukkah and we shake them in all directions and we say certain prayers. We say something like, God, you know our beings and we pray you guide us in every path we take under your protection. So these two aids, the sukkah and the lulav and etrog, help us to rejoice. You say, well, that doesn't make me happy. Yeah, but if you think what it is, it might. As we're told, we do this for seven days. But here's an odd thing. Did you hear that in the reading? Sukkot is actually an eight-day holiday. On the first day, do this. On the eighth day, do that. You probably are aware that seven is a biblical number for completion. Don't say perfection. Otherwise, eight would be imperfect. It's not. It's completion. Uh, some say, well, there you go. It's about fulfillment. Seven days make a week. Seven festivals complete the biblical appointment calendar with the Lord. Joshua marched around Jericho seven times. Then the walls fell. You get it. Seven completes things. So why eight days? In verse 36, we read, on the eighth day, we're to have a holy convocation. In the same way as an eight-day-old Jewish baby boy is circumcised with his whole future in view on the eighth day, the number eight is about new beginnings. That makes sense to me. Having completed the cycle of seven holidays, then as we conclude them, we say on the eighth day, we're going to start over and we will rejoice. In other words, this will continue. Now, the sukkah reminds us of the impermanence of life. And we sit in there to contemplate such each day and each night. The lulav, the etrog, remind us that God provides for us. And as a result, we rejoice. Or do we? I believe it all goes back to the command to remember. You see, we Jewish people lived off the land, and this holiday was designed to be celebrated when we arrived and lived in what we call Israel today. Bring a harvest offering. God is saying, okay, no problem, you and I might say. Let's say next week we're all supposed to, Pastor Steve gets a crazy idea and says, hey, let's bring a harvest agricultural offering to church. What would you do? Most of us would, you know, whether here in in the Gold Coast or where I live down in Sydney, we'd go to the local grocery, we'd buy some groceries, we'd put them in a basket, we'd swipe the credit card, (laughs) voila, done. But if you lived off the land and are dependent on the rain, the sunshine, the lack of floods and horrible weather like so much of the world has seen in the last few weeks, and you see the crops grow and the harvest is ready, then you know that it's the Lord who sustains you and provides for you. That remembering will trigger several things. You will rejoice. You will have more confidence in what God will do for you in the next occasion. You'll teach your children about him. You'll teach others about him. And finally, God himself will be glorified in us. How awesome is that? Let's now consider how the holiday was observed in the days of Yeshua. Besides the building of the Sukkot and the using of the vegetation to highlight God's provision, two other ceremonies were maintained. They were the great water pouring ceremony and the light ceremony, both taking place in Jerusalem. On the last day of Sukkot, there was a parade. I love that. A parade made up of priests with trumpets and ram's horns, even children waving palm branches. The scene was like Mardi Gras, only people had their clothes on, in a fashion. Uh, Definitely, it was like Mardi Gras in its celebratory tone. So from the top of Jerusalem, the parade began and made its way to the Pool of Siloam, which is down where the priests would collect water at the bottom of Jerusalem into large jugs. And there the people sang from Isaiah chapter 12, with joy, I drink the living waters. Do you remember that one? From the wells of salvation. The parade would again then ascend the hills and make it back up to the temple area. 
it would have been an awesome celebration. Have you ever been in a parade? How many of you have been in, in a parade? Just a handful. Okay. Not watching along the side. I mean, been in it. It's really exciting. Um, I was in New Orleans and leading a conference at a particular time, 1987, the Liberated Wailing Wall, the Jews for Jesus music team at the time was singing, and the Dancers of the New Jerusalem, that's a, a group my wife was dancing in in those days, uh, were dancing. There were, uh, I think at the beginning of that evening, there were 10,000 people in the Superdome. There were another 20,000 who came in by the time 7.30 began, and uh, we got off the stage and the evening began. But these, these thousands and thousands of people were parading in New Orleans in the same route that the Mardi Gras was, throwing Messianic and Christian and all kinds of godly things where people were ready for beads and whatnot. Parades can be very exciting. Well, this was a, a, a really significant time to party, if you will, because the rainy season began as Sukkot ends. It's still that way. So if it's delayed, if the rain does not come, as many of you here in Queensland would understand, crops will not grow in drought. So when the people yelled and the, and the, the priest would yell, uh, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready, and the people would yell, show your hand. And the priests would pour water onto the ground that's really a statement of faith that God would provide for us in the year and the years to come. Remember Elijah and the oil and the widow of Zarephath and use it up. So the Jewish interpretation book of the Bible titled the Talmud says this, if you haven't seen the water pouring ceremony and obviously the whole parade, you don't know joy. That must have been something. With that as a backdrop, no wonder it's startling to read in John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, from his belly or innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The priest had just poured out the water libation as an appeal to the creator God to provide water for the people. And Yeshua, as if to answer that prayer, tells the people to come to him for water. What a radical statement. What a shocker it would have been to the crowd. Jesus is claiming to be none other than the creator himself. Now, some recognized his authority. If you see that in John 7, he's plainly, they say in verse 41, he's the Messiah. Others were incensed. Some wanted to seize him and have him stoned for blasphemy. That is claiming to be God. Yet we read that the temple guards were unable to lay a hand on him. <laughs> when the Pharisees and chief priests questions the guard as to why they could not arrest him, they simply responded, no one has ever spoken the way this man does. <laughs> the temple guards were transfixed by Jesus' words. They were unable to act against him when faced with his obvious authority. Well, the Pharisees responded to those guards, as would many people today. You mean he's deceived you also? <laughs> they asked. It was inconceivable to some religious leaders that Yeshua's claims could be true. And therefore, they themselves, what would be the, they would be wrong. Pride prevented them from questioning their own supposed wisdom. God guard us from the same. The fact that they didn't believe became a settled matter once and for all. They reasoned that since they didn't believe it, it could not possibly be true. They held themselves up to be the proprietors of truth, the only authoritative interpreters of Torah, of the scriptures. The masses, they decided, were ignorant and deceived. They knew nothing of the law. Note this panel with the modern view of the Pool of Siloam, discovered in large part due to the laying of the pipeline for the modern sewage system. So they're digging the modern system, and they said, oh, and they found 
the actual pool of Siloam. Isn't that clever? Well, besides the water pouring ceremony, the other major event that took place during Sukkot was the great light ceremony, which would not only light the city, but also the countryside all around. There were four huge menorahs that were set up to illuminate the entire temple area. They were, they were 22 meters tall, which reads <laughs> seven stories high. Hmm. In actuality, they were so large that each of the stems formed a torch. The wicks were made from the worn out used linen garments of the priests. <laughs> As they didn't, you know, they didn't have electricity. As smaller torches were carried to light the procession, the people danced, they played harps, lyres, cymbals, and lutes. The Levites chanted the Psalms of Ascent, that's Psalm 120 to 134, one psalm on each of the 15 steps leading from the court of the Israelites to the court of the women. Imagine what a glorious scene it must have been with the majesty of the procession and the golden stone walls of the temple bathed in the glow of the torch-lit night. Have you been down to Melbourne and been along the Yarra when those flames come up on that gas torches? You, you, the first time it happens to you, you, you freak out a little. <sighs> on the hour, every hour, and it's pretty exciting. And that lights up the Yara. These seven-story tall torches, four of them, would have lit not just the temple area, but the whole countryside, because it's from a top. Can you see it? With those torches blazing in the sky, what a powerful word this must have been as Yeshua announced, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8. Not one of many, but the light, so that anyone and whosoever would walk in following him would have both light and life. That is massive chutzpah, gall, if you will. And yet he alone could say such. He is the Lord of life and the light of the world. Now with John 7, with the water pouring, and John 8, with the torch, we see John, the author of the gospel, merging these two beautiful ceremonies and proclamations of Yeshua in John chapter 9. There, you might remember, we see a blind man who meets him. The text says that Yeshua saw him. That's significant. The blind man didn't see Jesus. Jesus saw the blind man. <laughs> what God sees, he sees to. He deals with. So Yeshua sends the blind man to the pool of Siloam there at the bottom of Jerusalem. And he goes down and he washes and he rinses off and the blind man can see. The one who lived in the darkened world goes to the pool of Siloam, washes and sees. One other thing, Yeshua spat on the ground. Remember that? To make the mud to stick in the blind man's eyes. Why did he do that? What is he saying of himself? Remember, sometimes Jesus would say, for miracles, he'd say, stretch out your hand. Or he'd say, your sins are forgiven. But in this case, he bent down, spat, so it wasn't in Singapore. He spat on the ground, he made mud, stuck it in the guy's face, and sent him down. What's he saying of himself? He's like God in the garden, making man out of the dust of the earth. He is saying of himself, I am creator. Don't miss that. Do you see the combination of these two great Sukkot ceremonies? The pool of the water ceremony, which is where they get the water, is the pool of Siloam, and the light which lightens the entire darkened world all around Jerusalem. Yeshua says he is the light of life and the water of life. He provides for us in all circumstances, and he testifies to his being creator of us all. Hallelujah. John is fairly clever to link those. Now, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I, I do work for a nonprofit organization. I see some prophetic significance to the holiday of Sukkot, and I hope you do as well. We read the accounts in the Newer Testament, and they're even more helpful about the end of time. 
In Matthew chapter 17, there is a transfiguration mount. We read this. Yeshua was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Yeshua, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three Sukkot here, one for you, one for Moish, one for Elijah. Now, some of you have imagined that Peter was just one of those fly-off-the-handle guys and quick to answer and not really thoughtful. It's not the way I see this. What Peter saw in that transfiguration moment was that Yeshua was the great prophet, the Messiah. He saw the kingdom, and thus, if the kingdom is here, then the king is here, and so we should celebrate Sukkot. How? By building Sukkot. You know what happened in the Older Testament on this holiday? In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, King Solomon dedicated the temple, and he included you guys. I'm guessing most of you are Gentiles. Listen to what the text says, 2 Chronicles 6.33. It says this, God, this is Solomon's prayer, at the dedication of the holy temple. God, hear from heaven from your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know that you are the Lord. They may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel. And that they, that's Gentiles, may know that this house which I've built is called by your name. Solomon, dedicating the Jewish temple, is thinking about you guys. This is not Matthew 1. This is 2 Chronicles 6. The book of Numbers, chapter 29 in the Torah, provides a more detailed description of the sacrifices and burnt offerings that were made during this holiday that we start reading about in Leviticus 23. On the first day, in addition to all the regular temple offerings, 13 bulls were to be sacrificed, along with two rams, 14 male lambs, a goat for a sin offering. The number of bulls each day diminished. So 13 on the first day, 12 on the second day, 11, you get the idea, on the third day down to the final day. On the eighth day, only one bull was sacrificed. You can add that up, and you'll find 70 bulls. According to the Midrash on Psalm 109, the 70 bulls were for the 70 nations thought to be making up the world in those days. I mean, today we've got how many nations? And, and, and you know, 193, and how many of them vote against Israel in the UN? All right, um, but... Uh, how many, I mean, when you were a kid, weren't there less? All of a sudden now we've got Eritrea as well as Ethiopia. All of a sudden we've got South Sudan as well as Sudan. We had Yugoslavia, now we've got Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia. You see what I mean? Now, but in those days there were 70 nations for the Jewish people. That's how we counted. Whether there were 70 or not, that's what we counted. So it was one bull for each of the Gentile nations. The Gentiles were in view in God's economy way back in the days of Solomon and in the book of Numbers. Finally, in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, remember Nehemiah himself caused Israel to renew the covenant on the Feast of Tabernacles, which they'd not done since the days of Joshua, which was 800 years earlier. Zechariah predicted this. Listen to what he said. On that day, his feet, the Messiah, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and on the Mount of Olives it'll be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day, he goes on to say, there shall be no light, no cold, no frost. You don't know what that is, but you can read about it. 
uh, there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there will be light, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, and his, on that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. By the way, unlike most fault lines in the world, which run north-south, this fault line, which somehow Zechariah knew about in 530 B.C., went east to west. How did he know? Because God told him, as if the Jewish prophet Zechariah was a seismologist. But God knew. Look how the chapter ends. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep or celebrate or guard the, key, the, the feast of booths. So the Gentiles who were in view in the days of Solomon and in the heart of God are going to gather and celebrate God's provision to them, the provision of eternal life and relationship with the Almighty. And in the last book, nearly almost the last chapter, John the Revelator describes the end of time. In chapter 21 with these tabernacle words, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will, uh, there, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Pretty heavy, pretty glorious. Where did John the Revelator get that idea? From chapter 25 of Isaiah. Here we read, And the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all the peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord, God, will wipe tears away from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. So all peoples, not only us Jews, will enjoy God's banquet and death will be swallowed up forever. There will be no more tears. Tabernacles is the end of it all for all of us. When the seventh of seven meetings are concluded and God is all in all, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen? Do I have to prompt that? I don't think so. All right. What then is our conclusion? If Yeshua is the water of life, if he's the light of the world, if he wants all people, Jews and non-Jews, to know him and to enjoy him forever, then let's be about his business and announce him to the world, one person at a time, one Queenslander at a time, one Kiwi at a time, one Panther fan at a time, one Jew, one Gentile, one neighbor, one boss, one child, one grandparent. Let's proclaim him, Lord of all, to all, for their sake. These are some of my takeaways from this festival. You're going to have your own. Here's what I do. What our team does in Jews for Jesus, we proclaim him out on the streets, in people's homes, and in cafes. In New York City, where I joined our teams earlier this year, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in London, in Sydney, where I've worked for 26 years. And now the branch down in Sydney has been bolstered with a new couple and three, their three children. Uh, they grew up in Russia, Ukraine. They are, they've lived the last 10 years in Tel Aviv. And now they're joining our team if the visa comes through. I'm just so happy that this couple has joined us. And they've already energized and gathered people around them. And we had a meeting Friday night in Bondi Junction in Sydney, Sydney's East, with Russian Jewish people for the first time we've ever had a Russian Jewish outreach for Rosh Hashanah. And then this coming Friday, I'll be back by then, we'll have a Yom Kippur service with Russian, Hebrew, and English. And I'm so excited to see what this thing is going to morph into. 
I, I don't know. But the branch is, uh, is ministering to these folks each day, each week, and we proclaim him Lord of all. And one by one, Jewish people are listening, and others are listening. And if any man is thirsty, let him come to Yeshua and drink. He'll give to the humble living water and satisfy our thirst. You know, back in those days, they did not have straws. Yeshua said, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And how do you drink? You lift something higher than you and let it come down into you. Come to me and lift me up and drink from me and I'll fill you. I'll give you living water. That is Yeshua's words. I hope you'll keep praying for us.